Ladies and gentlemen, we are today also going to discuss a few among the host of challenges India may confront currently and in the foreseeable future. Before we have our eminent speakers share their considered views on the theme uh, entrusted to them, but permit me to very, very briefly flag certain issues which I am sure they would have already touched, uh, already going to touch upon in this in their presentations. Now, renowned strategic analyst Jen Lata Asnan will be sharing his thoughts with us on asymmetric warfare in the Indian context. You'll all agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that the principles of war do not change in haste. But the contours of war uh, does change in its many nuances. It is the view of so of many strategic analysts and military leaders that future wars will predominantly be asymmetric wars, also referred to as hybrid or gray zone warfare, where a weaker nation, non-state actors, terrorist organizations are capable to take on nations relatively superior in military capabilities to them. Asymmetric warfare is also assuming newer dimensions and has developed well beyond mere terrorist actions. Information and cyber warfare and sea piracy, as you've just seen, are indispensable forms of this form of warfare. How should India deal with these threats will be General Hasnan's thrust today. Now we will commence with our discussions for today. Before I request General Hasnan, permit me to say a few words uh, on this distinguished and highly decorated soldier. Jel Hasnan, who really does not require any introduction. You watch him on TV virtually every day and read his incisive writings in the media countless times. Thank you very much, sir, for inviting me. General Dawa, sir, for inviting me for this unusual kind of a gathering on Army Day. Wonderful to see scholars from all over, familiar faces, every one of them. It's always such a pleasure to come back here and uh, speak because one knows that you're speaking among friends and among very, very highly regarded intellectuals. And what better way than to be in the company of uh, one of the most uh, renowned diplomats, Ambassador Shyam Saran, my own uh, DS from Senior Command and my General Officer Commanding 3 Infantry Division when I was a Commanding Officer in the Siachen Glacier and in East of the Dach, General Tower, and General Govinda Singh, who was my platoon commander, one of our platoon commanders at the Indian Military Academy when I was a cadet way back in 1973-74. So, one can only bow one's head down, sir, while speaking and uh, say that it's just an honor to be here. Next 30 minutes or so, a wonderful subject, a subject that part of my heart. Uh, asymmetric warfare, something which uh, everyone is familiar with and uh, really needs no introduction, but yet in today's world there are so many interpretations of this terminology. There's always good to speak about the, the term itself right at the beginning and then go on to talk about some of the challenges that uh, the nation faces from this form of warfare and what can we really be doing about it. So the outset, let me be very theoretical in uh, explaining some of the final aspects of asymmetric warfare and then I shall go, down, go on essentially to address India's challenges and we start, we, start, we start looking. In fact, the army chief came to my assistance in a very big way with his uh, media conference on the 11th because everything he spoke is what I have to speak today. Right, and, 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 and admit, admittedly, one of the very good media conferences by an army chief in recent years, where uh, an admission, I would say such days are most important when you make admissions of failure in certain domains, which only gives you the strength to say we will bounce back, we will come back better. Otherwise, of course, these occasions are also to boast and talk about a lot of good things and achievements, etc., which must be done. But an admission of uh, the guilt of failure is, I thought, a very, very brave thing which the current army chief actually resorted to. So, as 
asymmetry simply means an absence of symmetry, I suppose. Warfare, any, and, and, and asymmetric warfare in simple terms means a battle in a, or an engagement between unevenly matched opponents. We saw it in the case of the US and Japan as in terms of nuclear asymmetry way back in 1945. You've seen it with the Allied forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. An asymmetric approach in subconventional warfare has been adopted by Al-Qaeda against the US and its allies and by Pakistan in its proxy wars against India. I think one of the very simpler ways of understanding it, a, a jet ski can frustrate a, a battleship. Remember US's coal. US's coal was taken apart by a small gunboat, small little boat, which came and, and struck it hard. A stone thrower can actually unnerve a general. And I can tell you this, I am one of those who experienced one of the first few stones being thrown uh, at anyone's car in Kashmir in 2008. On my car, one of the first stones was thrown. And frankly saying, I had no idea how to respond. So I have been asked to speak about uh, the shaping of uh, South Asia. Uh, so I will give a, um, a, a sort of a broad uh, picture. Uh, one, I would like to make the point that uh, the uh, region of South Asia, which also of course uh, was better known as the Indian subcontinent, uh, rightly so. Uh, this is to my mind a single geopolitical unit it is a single geo-economic unit. It is also today very importantly a single ecological unit. It's an integrated ecological space. It is also a shared cultural space uh, with a certain shared history. Uh, so uh, in every way this is uh, a one can even call it a, a, a kind of a geopolitical singularity. And I think the main challenge is that, you know, you cannot think in terms of security for uh, South Asia um, without taking into account this nature of this uh, uh, region as one single geopolitical region. But the reality is that this uh, single space is divided into several independent sovereign states. Uh, there are, it's, it's a fragmented space. And I think the important thing to realize is that for countries uh, in the region, threats that they perceive to their security, they do not see as coming from outside the space, uh, but from inside the space. Uh, so uh, that is uh, really the result of the great asymmetry of power that exists within this space. Uh, that is, you have India as an overwhelmingly powerful country economically, militarily, uh, which is much more than all the neighbors combined. So that's that's uh, the aspect of asymmetry, which, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, colors virtually uh, everything that happens uh, in this. Uh, in this. Uh, uh, and also, one would agree with with your views. Or, they were, they were so logical. I, I'm, I'm just curious uh, to know your views on, you know, the trade between us and Pakistan was stopped by Pakistan. From what I recall when we had this article 370 stuff, uh, you know, uh, the cricketer gentleman said, no, no trade. Then they tried, uh, I think, to start it and then he cleared it as a commerce minister, but stopped it as a prime minister. Or some some nonsense like that uh, took place. What I'm trying to get at is that, given the internal dynamics of Pakistan, because you know, it's, whilst it may be easier to deal with the other neighbors, you know, we can open up for Nepal, we can open up for Bhutan, we can open up for uh, Bangladesh. How will we handle this? The air defense missiles, uh, which, uh, to, uh, the missiles and drones that are fired at them. The fact is that there is a huge asymmetry in cost. So the attacker is firing uh, a missile at a fraction of a cost of what the defender is spending to defend. And therefore this entire issue, I think, is going to be something that we have to handle. In view of the importance of the maritime domain, I don't think this is something that we can ignore. 
uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, sweep under under the target uh, under any circumstances. The medium term uh, issue that we really have to handle is China. Now China is uh, uh, is uh, uh, in the maritime field uh, is is the uh, country to watch. Uh, I study China in great detail, and my new book is also on China. It's coming out shortly. Uh, on the maritime build-up over the last 40 years, from 1980, I think Deng Xiaoping realized uh, very astutely that, you know, and which we still haven't realized that China could never become a global power unless it was a maritime power. And therefore, they have devoted their attention very systematically to building up the maritime power. Uh, you know, while every country is is uh, sort of uh, authorized or should build up its maritime power, but the issue really is that today. The PLA Navy has surpassed every Navy, including the US Navy, in terms of major competence. Sir, in the course of next 25 or 30 minutes, uh, I will talk on the lessons from these two wars, which both were distant and unrelated to each other, and also as indeed to any role in them by our country, yet affording reflections which could frankly be obvious. But it takes wars like these to reiterate the obvious. For unfortunately, sometimes even the obvious gets buried under the debris of a prevailing and dominant narrative, which could sadly lull and distract the national mood and belief into believing simplistic, binary, and manufactured thoughts. My distinguished colleague, General Hosnan, he sagely covered the war and life in general. Both are becoming increasingly asymmetric, unpredictable, unconventional, and multidimensional beyond all known notions of normalcy. Uh, 